began reading this book. This book. This book. And it comes in hard cover now, so it's not just a free copy. A, a, a real solid thing that I've been into for, spent hours yesterday intrigued with this painter that had so much to say compared with Walt Whitman and Mark Twain as one of the people who shaped the character of our country in these times. And now the reviews and the raves have come, uh, not just from Amazon, <laughs> but from The Atlantic and The New Yorker are praising this book as the definitive book that will be now and forever. The final word on Winston. Oh. <laughs> and this, my friend, this is the Wall Street Journal. I didn't print it. This is the Wall Street Journal. Look at that full page. Uh, a tribute to a brushwood reality. No artist captured 19th century America more memorably than Winslow Homer, who painted solitary sailors, defiant Confederates, and emancipated blacks with equal sympathy. His great subject was human endurance. And so we just happen to have the author of this book here, right with us in the parish hall of Christ Church. And many are the folks here, including myself, uh, that prayed for this project. It was a long labor of love. So Bill, take it over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dean. Can everybody hear me? Yes. And we hope this is being recorded for anybody to hear me. Um, and I'm so grateful to all of you for being here. This is a moment for which I have been waiting for a long time. And it is such a, a joy and an honor to be here to speak among you. Because this is, as Dean suggested, truly a shared labor of love. And this book would never have gotten done were it not for the prayers and the practical support of many people in this parish, most especially Robin Davis, mm. who uh, with, uh, with her keen eye spotted in this uh, volume, which is not a book. It walks like a book, it talks like a book. But the paperback that is in front of Dean here is the Bound Galley Proofs that came out in late November um, for us to work through. And Robin, to her credit, spotted 2,800 errors. <laughs> Yeah, and that was after all of the copy editing from the people inside my publisher for Estraus and Giroux. Robin spotted them, and uh, I am so grateful that over the course of the next fast and furious six weeks, uh, we were able to address those errors and move on to the publication date of April 12th. So um, it is a real joy to be able to speak about this among you. Um, this, this painting is the centerpiece of an exhibition which has just opened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, it is the most ambitious exhibition of Winslow Homer's work in more than a generation. So, if you remember nothing else today, remember this. Run, do not walk to 82nd Street and 5th Avenue to see the show. <laughs> the luminous watercolors and spectacular oil paintings in Cross Currents reflect the role of tension or of conflict in Homer's work, particularly that made in his maturity. The focus of my biography, by contrast, is on determining the answer to a singular four-word question. What makes Wynn tick? By what circumstances was America's favorite painter formed such that even 
Americans who do not know his name do know his work. Because the right place to see such masterpieces as this is on the walls of the Met, my focus today will be on the man who created these monuments of our culture, but about whose life, until now, we have known so little. In examining his life and his art, I hope you may find resonance with your lives and our times today. It's particularly meaningful for me to speak here because I've considered this man's life amid a broader reflection on the flourishing life that you, my sisters and brothers in Christ, have each exemplified in different ways to me. In your engagement with the world and with one another, you show me what in my other job, uh, which is as chairman of the advisory board of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, my, my colleagues call a life worth living. The story of this life worth living begins in the waning years of the Jackson presidency, when the wife of a failed Boston merchant delivered her second child amid the clutter and stench of Boston's North End. Adjacent to wharves where Homer's father sought in vain to find his fortune. Tension was present throughout Homer's childhood. Drivers of anxiety for his parents, uncles, aunts, and cousins, of which on his father's side alone, Winslow had 45, were economic, social, and moral, ranging from the panic of 1837, the year after Homer's birth, to accelerating antebellum division over the greatest moral question of the day, slavery. Homer's family was itself riven with conflict. Both his parents were devout Christians, but his mother and her nuclear family members practiced their faith at Park Street Church, where abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison preached the gospel of freedom. Homer's father, by contrast, worshiped at the Bowdoin Street Church, led by another renowned preacher, Hubbard Winslow. Winslow declared that the best response to slavery was not agitation of the kind that Garrison propagated, but a calm and fixed rest of mind. Somehow, robust trade between Boston merchants, many of them sitting in his pews, and well-meaning people in southern ports, and surely it would all work out. <laughs> to say that Garrison disagreed with Winslow is putting it mildly. He described him as a prophet of Baal and effectively an apologist for slavery. Homer's father not only followed Hubbard Winslow's thinking closely, but persuaded his wife to name their newborn son after the pastor and eventually to join her husband as a member of Winslow's church. The Boston of Homer's childhood was hub to trade, both with ports in the southern states of the U.S., most importantly for the Homer family, Mobile, Alabama, where three of Homer's six paternal uncles settled, two of them permanently, uh, but also across the whole Atlantic world. Trade routes to the Pacific also grew in importance in the 1840s. As a child, Winslow Homer would have heard much about them. In 1841, when Winslow was just five, two of his mother's brothers, Alfred and Arthur Benson, <coughs> negotiated a secret and exclusive government contract to supply the seaports of the Oregon Territory. So when Mexico ceded 55% of its territory to the U.S. in early 1848, and when settlers <laughs> discovered gold in the American River in late 1848, the value of the Benson's control over these sea routes rose sharply. In the hope of capitalizing on these connections, Homer's father traveled to California, but seems not to have stayed long. In one of his earliest surviving drawings, the 14-year-old boy memorialized his father's voyage 
with an imaginative sketch of an intrepid Argonaut riding across the country in an airship, his wheelbarrow and other tools tied behind him. <laughs> the stick figure pilot guides his rocket over farms, hills, and towering mountains, his top hat lost to the winds. Homer focused also on the miners who are viewers of this science fiction spectacle, some of whom salute the airship with a celebratory greeting as one dances a jig and another looks closely through his telescope. It's all about what is seen and is overlooked. As the pilot makes his precipitous descent over the Sierra Nevada range, some miners react in alarm while others naively fail to see the impending disaster. Winslow already knew the power of sight, the power of storytelling, the language of risk, and the effective role that sly humor might play in communicating ideas. Unlike his precocious older brother, Charlie, a brilliant chemist at Harvard, Winslow and his younger brother, Arthur, attended Cambridge's less admired Washington Grammar School. Winslow appears to have dropped out to begin work by the summer of 1853, shortly after he turned 17. His boss was a Boston lithographer, John Henry Buford, whose downtown crossing workshop depended both on plentiful labor for presses and for costly limestone blocks, and on plentiful labor. Buford hired apprentices like Homer to do three things. Grind down the blocks in the foreground, draw appealing designs on them, and then in the background, print the finished products from sheet music to theater tickets to book illustrations. Two of those three purposes, grinding and printing, required fewer brains than brawn. But the middle one, drawing in crayon on limestone, necessitated both long hours and delicate skill as a draftsman. The slender, reserved Homer had that skill and that dedication and the encouragement of his mother, who was herself a talented amateur painter. About nine months into his apprenticeship for Buford, another boy arrived in downtown Boston, not far from Homer's birthplace in the North End. This boy was similar in age to Homer, but from Virginia. His name, Anthony Burns, soon became famous not only in Boston, but across the nation. Burns had escaped slavery by clambering aboard a ship bound for Boston. The man who claimed ownership of him hired a so-called slave catcher who abducted Burns and delivered him to a waiting U.S. Marshal on the courthouse steps. There, with the approval of Boston's mayor and the President of the United States, the young Burns was tried for violation of the Fugitive Slave Act. The brilliant oratory of his Harvard-trained counsel, Richard Henry Dana, who lived a stone's throw from Homer, failed to persuade the court. In chains, Burns was marched down State Street before the eyes of 50,000 people, one third of Boston's population. The sight and the story was catalytic. Prosperous merchants, even in the textile industry, which depended on Southern cotton, would write, as one did, that we went to bed one night, old-fashioned, conservative, compromised union Whigs, and waked up stark, mad abolitionists. The naked question emerged. In fulfilling the demand of the man who claimed he owned Burns, had the United States itself inflicted a crime both against one teenage boy and against the core of its own ideals. Homer leaves us no documents telling us what he thought of Burns' trial or what he said of it to his neighbor, the lawyer Dana, author of Two Years Before the Mast. But in 1856, as the nation's temperature continued to rise, he composed a lithograph depicting another act of violence. this time on the floor of the U.S. Senate. There, shortly after Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts delivered his speech, The Crime Against Kansas, 
South Carolina's Congressman Preston Brooks beat him. Across the top of the print, Homer ran a quote from Brooklyn's Henry Ward Beecher, whose brother had been pastor at Park Street Church to Winslow's mother. The symbol of the North is the pen. The symbol of the South is the bludgeon. Homer's skill as a draftsman on paper and on stone opened a new door in 1857. The illustrated newspaper invented 15 years earlier in London had come to, Bach, to America. A Bostonian publisher, Maturin Ballou, put Homer on staff, then retained his services as a freelancer to draw another kind of print for his paper, a wood engraving. Homer's designs were distinctive in their rhythmic geometry, their contrasts of light and dark, their humor and suspenseful narrative ambiguity. They often included a subtle nod to matters they seemed on the surface not to address. Here, for example, he depicts a watering cart intended to suppress dust on Boston streets. And it just happens to stop outside the windows of the shop operated by the renowned abolitionist Charles F. Hovey. These prints were well suited for the production system of illustrated newspapers, but had their disadvantages too. For example, limiting tone relative to lithographs. Line in wood engravings was everything. And wood engravings required not only a skilled draftsman, such as Homer working both on paper and on tightly grained wood blocks, but on another man, a wood engraver, who would complete the work by cutting into the block where Homer had drawn. That process converted the artist's two-dimensional design into a delicate relief. The wood engraver's work was exacting and earned about the same amount of money the draftsman's work did. Although Winslow prospered among the burgeoning group of Boston <laughs> illustrators, the city of his birth had limited artistic depth. There were no classes there for drawing from life models, and its long-standing publishers were more cautious than the brash New Yorkers led by the Harper Brothers, who in the late 1850s grew the market share of their weekly illustrated newspaper at the expense of Blues, whose staff and freelance artists and artisans saw the writing on the wall. In the summer of 1859, when he was just 23, Homer moved to a boarding house in New York, just off Union Square. For the following 22 years, and for significant parts of the three decades after that, New York was home to Homer. And for much of that period, through 1875, Homer earned his living primarily through the sale to Harper's and other publishers of his designs for wood engravings. The Christmas-themed wood engraving Homer created several months after he arrived sheds light on his values and on the city in which he lived. Around an oculus inscribed the origin of Christmas, where awestruck shepherds worship the luminous newborn Lord. Homer depicts two contrasting scenes of the day's celebration in contemporary New York. In one, a goat-drawn sleigh arriving at a hovel on 59th Street reflects the poverty in which many of Homer's neighbors lived yet also their genuine joy. In the other, a splendid horse-drawn carriage exemplifies the lavish level at which other New Yorkers lived. Homer delights not so much in the dancing children or their bored parents in the foreground, but in the background of the festive scene where lovers kiss before the ignoring and embarrassed eyes of black servants and an even more scandalous sight. Mixed company drinking at a common table. And a pair of gentlemen trying out two different models of stereoscopes, perhaps newly acquired Christmas presents. A sly Homeric nod to the role of invention in affecting how and what we see. The composition is uniquely Homer's, incorporating <coughs> acute observation <coughs> and calm critique of social mores. When the long-brewing Civil War broke out, demand rose sharply for illustrated newspapers that could make sense of the distant but pivotal military action. Publishers competed to convey the most complete sense of the war. Illustrations could tell stories beyond the words accompanying them, 
if conceived and executed well. Most illustrators showed the war, war's broad landscape, the strategies and tactics of the generals as they deployed their armies like figures on a chessboard. By contrast, Homer bore witness to the everyday drama of war, the life of the ordinary foot soldier, not the general. And in so doing, he offered complex but accessible compositions whose narrative only the viewer could complete, connecting the men at the front to lives back home. In News from the War, for example, Homer hangs each scene from telegraph wires across the top, tightly integrating them thematically and visually. The device pays sly homage to the university building on Washington Square, into which Homer himself had just moved, and where wires from Samuel Morse's successful experiment inventing the telegraph still hung from the building's ceilings. Each panel of Homer's illustration tells a story in which news arrives, by letter, conversation, or even the sound of a bugle. In just one panel does it arrive on the printed page, whose speedy arrival accentuates the urgency of news telling. That's at lower right. As always, Homer starts with particularity, even about a place that he could only imagine. In a deliberately ambiguous scene, at upper right, three pairs of figures appear on a street corner in Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy. One of them is a spy. Which one? The affluent white woman with her faithful hound? One of the imprisoned federal officers out for air from his cell in a prison on Tobacco Row? One of the men receding in the background, seen from the back? Or the black woman with a towering basket on her head? Decide for yourself once you read my book. Which is, which is the source of news from Richmond to the north? Homer opens his narrative for the viewer to imagine the quiet drama and to consider the outcome of the story he begins. Ever observing, he invites his own observers to share in his engagement with what he sees, to interrogate and complete it. Homer could sell a design such as News from the War for about $100 the equivalent of $2,700 today. In those days, he could sell an oil painting, such as this one, for about the same value. But he aspired to become a painter, not just an illustrator. And for that, he needed to paint. With Homer's success as an illustrator depicting life in camp in wood engravings, he turned naturally to that same subject in his first canvases, such as this one. He also chose the title with considerable care, Home Sweet Home. A man of few words, his titles were often as multivalent as his pictures. The subject of home permeated the Civil War. For all those who had a stake in it, the enslaved who had no home, the Confederates who believed that only through secession could they retain their home, and the federal troops who fought ultimately for a larger mission, a reimagined home and America anointed by God for his purposes. Homer's picture depicts two soldiers listening as the musicians of their regiment play the plaintive tune that opens, mid pleasures and palaces though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Homer draws both on the sentiments in the song itself and on a specific incident that would have been well known to his New York audiences. On the evening of December 30th, 1862, 100,000 troops of the Federal Army of the Potomac were gathered on the north side of the Rappahannock River, not far from Fredericksburg, Virginia, where they had fought an especially bloody battle little more than two weeks earlier. On the south side of the river stood 70,000 Confederate troops. The military bands of each army played for their own troops and for those across the river the Federal Band playing Yankee Doodle Dandy, and the Confederate Band playing Dixie. And then, as a Confederate private recorded, both bands, with one accord and simultaneously, struck up Home Sweet Home. There was not a sound from anywhere until the tune was finished, and it then seemed as if everybody had gone crazy, cheering, jumping up, 
and throwing up hats. Their hearts were touched then, but they were yet men who were willing to do or die. Homer's sponsor in the Federal Army was a man named Frank Barlow, who entered as a private, was badly wounded twice, and ultimately became a general, despite his youthful and casual appearance. This is Frank Barlow with his uh, distinctive vest. When, after the war, Homer painted the picture for which over the following decade he was most acclaimed, he placed Barlow in it as an archetype of the cool federal officer at odds with the three ragged Confederate prisoners. But the boy general is not at the center of the scarred battlefield of Petersburg, Virginia. Instead, with geometric precision, a dashing red-headed southerner appears with a cross on his sleeve and his jacket and trousers slightly unbuttoned. Why and how that is the case is a matter of inference. Decide when you read the book whether you agree with my It may surprise you. This picture is an invitation to look longer, deeper, and broader. Let it ask you questions, even and especially those that make you uncomfortable. Homer often deployed pairs, pairs with figures in his pictures, and sometimes pairs of pictures, pendants. He painted a pendant to prisoners, the same size, and asking some of the same questions in a different way. Nowhere near as renowned, it is called the brush harrow. Homer's setting is another field, but without evidence of its history, or indeed its location. He includes two figures, boys too young to have fought in the war. Perhaps brothers, they labor in the field because their father, dead or injured, cannot. The improvised device the battle-worn horse drags, made mostly of brush, is called a harrow. This word, uncommon today, was then rich in agricultural, theological, and philosophical meaning. Harrowing is an act of promise, almost, but not yet, fulfilled. Only after the soil is plowed can it be harrowed. Then only after, after it is harrowed can it be seeded. Just as Christ's resurrection awaited first, his harrowing of hell. These barefoot boys anticipate a future they cannot see, but for which, nevertheless, they prepare. The brush harrow's subtlety denied the possibility of the jingoistic interpretation prisoners allowed, yet it speaks powerfully of the charged, layered emotions of the country. Sorrow, hope, longing, and lingering doubt. The war's end and Homer's success as an illustrator meant that at last he might travel to Europe. He would have agreed heartily with his exact contemporary, Samuel Clemens, who wrote that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. <laughs> Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. <laughs> Another contemporary of Homer's, his fellow American painter Whistler, had just returned to London from Chile with this picture. He too would have agreed with Twain. Whistler would have known of Homer's work and vice versa. But whether they met then is a matter of about which we can only speculate. It is certain, however, that Homer saw a lot of art in both the UK and France. And he surely saw his own paintings, one of them prisoners, on display at the Exposition Universelle, as well as the work of French painters his own generation, such as Manet, here painting an American Civil War battle 
waged in water. It's just off the French coast. And the work of French painters a generation older than him, such as Millet, here with his iconic gleaners. Millet's inspiration is especially evident in the work Homer made in the rich flat fields of Picardy, north of Paris. Upon his return to the US, Homer began the work for which he is best known. One of the ironies of his career is that before the late 1860s, this artist, now so closely associated with marine painting, had never made one. At 33, he exhibited his first oil of the sea, which he called Manchester Coast. The critics hated it, one saying that the most noticeable point appears to be the dashing of the ocean spray above the rocks, but as indicated by Mr. Homer, it resembles the work of a boy who has dashed a spitball upon a newly papered wall. The critic was revealing how little he understood Japanese prints, about which Homer had already learned much from his friend John Lafarge, who had demonstrated his own adaptation of ideas based on his print collection. In, for example, this painting on the left completed the previous year. Lafarge understood the hostile climate for innovative art well enough to not exhibit his painting. Homer did exhibit his. Both pictures synthesized the lessons of Japanese prints, including a high horizon line, a contrast between the distant view and the exacting description of the foreground, and a slightly asymmetrical, vertigo-inducing composition. The pattern of Homer's life included summers in the country, making abundant field sketches, now mostly and lamentably lost, and autumns when, in his New York studio, he converted them to new oil paintings. Although he could sell his illustrations year-round, winter and spring were exhibition season, after which the cycle began all over again. From the end of 1865, when he was elected to membership, the Century Association was the hub of his social and commercial life. He benefited from the companionship and counsel, both artistic and commercial counsel, of his many friends there, including writers, editors, and several pivotal fellow artists, one of them Lafarge. He seldom let his guard down, but in such companionship, it did happen on rare occasions. One of the few things that Winslow Homer is ever recorded to have said about his painting methodology is something that a friend wrote down. When I have selected the thing carefully, I paint it exactly as it appears. That is, Homer used his remarkable powers of observation in a very specific way, considering his context deliberately, setting his frame precisely, and then expressing what he observed within it. A simple example is this picture, which he composed in such a way that he would exclude the derelict warehouse here, visible on the right in this photograph, which amazingly includes the same model that Homer used in his oil painting. And within the frame that Homer set, he painted with exactitude not the cartographic reality that painters such as Fitzhenry Lane depicted, but the truthful appearance to him. One example is this famous picture, which is in the Met Exhibition, and is based on his time staying with a painter friend in Palinville, New York. We can pinpoint the details of his context by, among other threads, a stereograph, which survives in a Catskills library. The comparison of Homer's painting with the stereograph leaves little doubt that his production of the canvas in his New York studio depended not only on his own field sketches, but on this photograph. What other such evidence may yet emerge over the decades ahead? In 1872, Homer moved to the 10th Street Studio building. It was a cultural hothouse in which Homer remained to live and work for eight years until the spring of 1880. This was the period of his most intense cross-pollination in the New York art world during which, as an example, he joined the Tile Club, a circle of painters and others in the arts who purposefully and with great humor painted handmade Spanish tiles, occasionally throwing them at one another in frustration. 
1873, surely encouraged by others of the century and in the 10th Street Studio building, he journeyed to Gloucester, Massachusetts, near the site of his first exhibited marine painting, Manchester Coast. By summer's end, Homer had produced a suite of 10 watercolors he was willing to display, albeit with such hesitation that he gave none of them titles or prices. This first exhibited watercolor set, like his wood engravings, is composed of stark geometric shapes. The sheets embed a narrative ambiguity that draws his viewers into the stories Homer has begun, inviting their completion in the eyes and minds of those to whom he appeals. Some of the early watercolors reflect his interest in the lives of black children, such as this example of Homer's interest in contrasting pairs of figures. Over the years that Homer followed, uh, the, over the years that followed, Homer's outstanding talents as a painter and watercolor led him to create not only true masterpieces of American art, but among the greatest such works ever made anywhere in the world. They include radiant tropical sheets, of which there are many in the Met exhibition, and a series of dramatic sunsets that he painted on a return trip to Gloucester in the summer of 1880, when he lived on Ten Pound Island with the lighthouse keeper and his family in the middle of the harbor, immersed in the magical meeting of land, sea, and sky. That long, productive summer led Homer back to England where he spent 20 months in 1881 and 1882, primarily in the North Sea fishing village of Cullercoats near Newcastle. There he painted this oil with its own Whistler-like painting within a painting. While he was in England, Winslow, his brothers, and his parents initiated a major new phase in their family's life, and especially in his. The family bought a large chunk of Prout's Neck, a dozen miles uh, south of Portland, and Winslow remodeled a stable to become his studio. And my new friend Bruce, in the back here, lived in the studio uh, in more recent years. Brad, I'm sorry, <laughs> forgive me, Brad. <laughs> oh. So Homer's first years at Prout's were ones of enormous productivity for which Brad and all others associated with, with Prouts are very proud, rightly proud. He focused for the first time on, on the acute and innate longing shared by all people for salvation. And then mortal themes became central to his work as in the contrasting pendants of the herring net and the fog warning. He depicted a fruitful harvest of small fish on the left, caught by a pair of men close to shore, against an uncertain outcome in pursuit of large fish caught alone far out at sea at right at potential loss of the fisherman's life. Mm -hmm. A third painting made after this pair is distinct from them, but related. It is such an important monument of American culture that over the last 24 years, it has never left the dining room of its owner. This person whose contract with me allowed publication of the picture in the book only if I pledged, among other things, never to include the picture in a talk like this, <laughs> or ever to name its owner, is now hanging in the Met exhibition. And the story of how and why Homer created it is in the book. <laughs> As many of us have found in our own lives, after a period of immense productivity, a slump can follow. For Homer, the slump turned into a depression. A friend who bumped into him wrote, Homer says he has not painted much for a year and won't paint when he don't feel like it. From what he said, he's like all the rest of us, has no encouragement. What turned things around was his return in 1889 to a place where he had spent many happy days fishing in the early 1870s. 
the clearing in Minerva, New York, in the Adirondack region. What had been a simple farm had just become a club that Homer was invited to join. There he found not only congenial companionship, but more importantly, confidence that perhaps his favorite author, an Anglo-Scots physician, was correct when he wrote that everything bears the mark of order impressed upon it by the almighty hand. Homer's newfound delight in God's created and orderly world as he was immersed in it is as tangible as the trout he painted. He sees in awe the working out of an invisible but benevolent design. The trout have sprung from the rippled, nurturing shallows for a brief moment, just as has their prey. Homer catches all of it in mysteriously ordered bounds. The fish, the bug, the lily pads, and the air he too breathes. He relishes the suspense of the moment and its extreme brevity for the three characters in his drama. His sense of wonder did not mean that he was blind to vulnerability and death, but rather that he believed in the sovereign hand of God, that this side of heaven requires that we see through a glass darkly, in faith that one day we may see face to face. So in Homer's largest painting, Fox Hunt, it's not the ravenous crows with which he empathizes, but the tired old fox, as his own signature sinks also into the snow at lower left. And this too is working out of an order that is observed and attended by the Almighty, who made all creatures. Homer presents a tragedy for us, but he does not give away its ending and he cares about all his characters. Among the characters in whom Homer took a profound interest were the indigenous people around Lake St. John in Quebec. He saw himself in them, perhaps, as outsiders making their way on soil and water they cherished and whose ancestors had known them for centuries. And to return where we started, the picture which Homer insisted be called the Gulf Stream enlists our empathy for the man at its center, who the painter sets firmly in context. The Gulf Stream is, as the oceanographer Matthew Morey wrote, a balance wheel. Homer set his model as an everyman in the heart of the exquisite machinery by which the harmonies of nature are preserved of all God's creations, only man and woman are made in God's image, imago dei. Humans are therefore uniquely able to perceive the developments of order and the evidences of design, which make it a most beautiful and interesting subject for contemplation. All viewers of all races who look with open eyes will care about the fate of the man in the Gulf Stream. His fate is that of us all. Each of us lives within the balance wheel of God's exquisite machinery, whether we know it or not. After the painting's first viewing, Homer repainted the starboard gunnel to be broken and placed a sail. Hmm. So there's the break and there's the sail wrapped like a shroud at the gunnel's edge. Perhaps most importantly, which is not visible, I'm afraid, he gave the worn vessel a name and a home port, Key West. Trust me, up in the flesh you'll see it at the map. Um, Annie and Key West. The model from whom he made his field sketches was surely Bahamian, but in Homer's reworking, he bestowed on the Annie and her soul crew a narrative particularity. Every man has become an American, and he is black. 
In late 1906, fewer than four years before Homer's death, the trustees of the Metropolitan Museum agreed under pressure from a group of artists to purchase the picture. They'd come to recognize that Winslow Homer had created work whose visual significance to our culture is as great as the contributions of Walt Whitman, Emily Dickinson, and Mark Twain had made in literature. Despite the recognition his work received, Homer's life changed little. Over all that life, in his close observation, his idiosyncratic yet skillful hand, and his heart for all he encountered, Homer practiced the principles he learned in his youth. He wrote that the life that I have chosen gives me my full hours of enjoyment for the balance of my life. The sun will not rise or set without my notice and thanks. On behalf of myself and my publisher and this gentleman, thank you for coming. And I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. And the first question comes as it should from my friend and partner, Robin Davis. <laughs> And there are many Homer paintings that are very difficult to photograph, uh, even with very good uh, camera equipment, uh, and are also difficult to see in photographs, especially where there's nice natural light flowing into the room. Um, so um, I, I do go back to what I said earlier, make plans to go to New York before the show closes on July 31st. Um, but what we see here is a, uh, a young man on a demasted uh, sailing vessel, perhaps a, a sloop, um, who is clutching canes of sugar. Sugar being a key commodity um, across the Caribbean, uh, which was of course grown by slaves. Um, and he is encircled at least in, in um, the foreground, uh, by sharks who seem to be aware that they may um, have a hapless human being on board um, who may be future lunch meat for them. Um, he also has other uh, fish around him, specifically these fish, which are flying fish. Um, recognized as symbols of freedom um, during this period for emancipated Americans. The red in the water is ambiguous. Is it seaweed? Um, is it something else? Homer leaves us guessing. He also leaves us guessing as to the outcome of this story that he begins. Um, will this vessel be submerged in the midst of a storm? Will it be spotted by a ship that he added uh, over the years after he first exhibited the painting? Um, the ship is quite ghost-like and seems to be uh, distant enough that perhaps those on the ship have no idea of this man's plight. Um, the, um, the painting seems indebted to two works, which you can see without going to New York, um, and Homer would have known. 
One is a painting that is the centerpiece of another exhibition, Turner in the Modern World, which is opened recently at the Museum of Fine Arts. And that painting called The Slave Ship was a very powerful expression by the English painter, um, a good deal older, uh, 1775 to 1851, uh, J.M.W. Turner, of his um, criticism of the institution of slavery. And, and that depicts um, slaves who were thrown off a ship in order to uh, allow the owner of that cargo to receive, uh, to make a claim uh, for losses from his insurance company. Um, the second painting that you can see at the MFA that Homer would have seen as he was um, conceiving of this great painting is Watson and the Shark which is a depiction by John Singleton Copley of another dramatic incident, also in the Caribbean, in, in the harbor, in fact, off Havana, in which the future Lord Mayor of London, uh, as, a, as a boy, um, lost his leg to a shark. And there is a quite similar design to this shark as to the uh, the shark in the Copley painting. Um, so Homer often is perceived as a bit of a rube, um, and you know he he was a high school dropout, um, but nevertheless he was a very quick learner and absorbed influence not only from Japanese prints and from contemporary French painting, uh, but from lots of other sources too. And so this painting made. Um, 11 years before his death and then reworked over the years uh, after that um, became a culmination of all that he had learned over his life and also a, a, a multivalent expression of his conviction that all of us are in desperate need of salvation. Um, does that help Robin? Yes, thank you. Thanks. George, my friend. I'm delighted in the book. I haven't gotten out of you talking about that one of the painting behind you. Um, uh, and I don't know how you do it. I don't know whether you mastered uh, your history class uh, in 19th century America or the, the, uh, and, and just building a line. It's amazing what depth you have as well as breadth. And it's much more than just about a painter. It's about cultural history, too. I'm, I'm learning a lot. Uh, and do you talk about that black man on the boat uh, who is about the age of the emancipation, that this is a, that the beautiful ship the black man was on and being free uh, is suddenly demasted and there are sharks which are destroying everything that was put forward? Um. There is, so one of Homer's great interests, which um, I didn't address here, was the tragic history of Reconstruction. And the promise of, of Reconstruction in which his own brother was engaged uh, working for the Texas Freedmen's Bureau. And the tremendous disappointment of Reconstruction's failure uh, in, a, in the years leading up to 1876 and 1877, when it was um, basically taken over um, and, and effectively the, the South won the peace, having lost the war, um, and in many ways reinstated a, um, a pernicious system that, um, that we're still dealing with today. Um, Homer was acutely aware of that promise and brought it in through the flying fish and acutely aware of the, um, the disappointment and the violence within which those power structures survived. And we see them in the other fish 
the sharks in the, in the foreground. Um, his identity was, as I suggested, riven with conflict. So he identified both with um, the merchants north and south, um, from whom he, he uh, was raised, uh, and the outsiders of uh, the enslaved, the indigenous people, um, and, and those who were in many ways voiceless. Um, so I think that this picture reflects uh, that sense that there are many ways uh, into the story that uh, he needs to draw us and ultimately lead even Americans who in 1899 might not have easily identified with a black man to do so. This picture took um, seven years to sell. Uh, it wasn't uh, something that many collectors wanted, uh, hanging over their dining room fireplaces as they ate. <laughs> Um, but it is, I believe, one of the great monuments of our culture, comparable to Invisible Man or Leaves of Grass or Little Women. And, uh, and I, I hope that you will be able to spend time uh, eyeball to eyeball with, with this unidentified model um, and, and with this great achievement of, of Homer's. Jack. Um, Can you say anything about the uh, sort of history of the art critic and art historian's response to Homer's work over time? Is it all upward or is it ebb and flow? And what about you know, European critics versus American critics? Can you say anything? So even to this day, European critics utterly ignore Winslow Homer. Um, and as, um, as evidence of that, this exhibition, which the Met has originated, um, will go to London uh, and be on Trafalgar Square at the National Gallery starting September 10th. But it's the first time that European audiences have been able to see a full Homer retrospective. Um, and, and even other great American painters are largely obscure to European audiences. The, uh, there are a few Winslow Homer works in European collections, but there's nothing at the National Gallery uh, in their permanent collection now. Uh, and in fact, I don't think there's anything in any other British collection today. Um, the, the works that I know by Homer um, in Europe are there's one at, at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and then there are a handful in Madrid, one of which is very important uh, and is on loan to the, to the Met. Um, American critics, by contrast, uh, and this perhaps may explain why European critics have ignored Homer, American critics have regarded him as a, an expression of national um, masculinity to a great extent, at least during his lifetime. He was regularly called virile, and, um, and there were many ways in which this slender, mild-mannered um, gentleman who dressed immaculately and uh, didn't say much, didn't write much, uh, was regarded as a, a kind of um, spokesman for 19th century national identity. I think that he liked that. It helped sell pictures, even if it wasn't uh, particularly fulsome in its truth. There was much more to him than this curmudgeonly um, isolated uh, character battling the weather at Prout's Neck, Maine. Um, but it helped him and his gallerists to sell art, to depict him that way, and to ignore small realities like 
there are six or seven hotels and boarding houses in Prout's Neck. Um, Prout's Neck isn't a fishing village. There were 50% more doctors and butchers in Prout's Neck than there were fishermen. Um, it would be more accurate to call Prout's Neck a doctoring village um, or a butchering village than to call it a fishing village. Um, but um, it made good sales for him to develop a, a myth. Um, and critics um, from essentially the moment that he began making watercolors had gradually um, positive and increasingly positive reviews of him. That didn't mean that his pictures always sold. <clears throat> so for 10 years after Prisoners from the Front was uh, exhibited in 1866, the general lament was, you know, can't he do something as good as Prisoners? Um, and then in 1876, he uh, exhibited as a, a kind of valentine to America on its centennial year. He exhibited several paintings, um, but most of all, Breathing Up, uh, with which um, I, it's the, the picture set in Gloucester that I had at the beginning that became a postage stamp. Um, and um, so that was uh, a, a, a picture that many people identified with. Um, he, in 1880, made these uh, very loose watercolors, including the one I showed at the end, uh, the sunsets, and, and critics didn't quite know what to make of them. But there was broad recognition in his lifetime and after his lifetime that this was a, uh, a really great painter. Um, and so he never really went out of favor. Um, but um, but it took a while in his lifetime for people to recognize that watercolors are themselves works of art, uh, not just sketches, and that in his, quote, sketchiness, he was making great work, if that helps. Yes? Quick question. Did he yeah. ever marry or have children? He never married. He never had children. And to my consternation, he never kept diaries either. <laughs> And his letters are not particularly useful. So he had many important relationships with men and women. I suspect that there were no relationships that were ever consummated in a sexual sense, um, that he was repressed in that regard and was um, content in, within measures um, to live somewhat in solitude for, for periods, but not always. So this idea of this being in complete solitude, never seeing anybody for many winter months isn't really entirely true. He, he would be in his studio, um, sometimes with a servant, um, for long periods but he would be a few miles from a train that would allow him to go down to Boston for a couple of days, which he often did in the winter. Um, and he often went to New York. So even though he was a legal resident of the state of Maine for the last 27 years of his life, he spent periods of a few days to a few months in New York over those 27 years. And he often went to, um, tropical locations um, or the Adirondacks for breaks which included other people, not just different weather. So hope hope that helps. Yeah. Yes, Liz. So I'm curious about other painters who had short times on Cape Ann, just thinking locally. And I was thinking especially of Edward Hopper, who I know was later, but I'm just curious if there's records, and maybe you get to this in the book, about how Winslow Homer interacted with sort of the other American painters of his time and a little bit after. Yeah, that's a great question. And if I can put a plug in, um, next summer, my lifelong friend, Elliot Davis, will be curating 
an exhibition at the Cape Ann Museum on Edward Hopper. And that will be wonderful. She's got a terrific book um, that is now basically complete. She's already written the wall text and the object labels. Um, and, uh, and I hope you all will see that many times. Um, Hopper was, even though Hopper met his wife and fell in love in Gloucester, Hopper was somewhat less inclined to do what most painters in Gloucester did, which was to hang out with each other. Um, and Homer was similarly somewhat less inclined to hang out with others, but one of the things that he really didn't want you to know, but which uh, I uh, was delighted to publish, is that when he came to Gloucester in 1873, um, he was not the only painter in town. There were very few others, but there was one other who he knew well, and who just at the moment that he first made watercolors for exhibition, happened to be one of the leading um, evangelists for the medium of watercolor. And that was Albert Fitch Bellows, not a household name today, but in that period, a very important painter. And I think it's really significant that Homer, who lied about where he was going, um, came to Gloucester just at the moment that one other painter was there, and it was Bellows. Um, not to be confused with George Bellows, Albert Fitch Bellows, he was the watercolor evangelist. So um, he, Homer had a number of other painter friends, uh, some of whom came here. Uh, Joseph Foxcroft Cole was, was one who spent a lot of time in France. Um, and, and there were other Cape Ann um, painters after that primarily. He would have been aware of Fitzhenry Lane um, and John Wilmerding's brilliant uh, short essay in the catalog that I did for the 2019 show um, speculates quite intelligently about the possibility of certainly Homer seeing Lane's work and possibly even meeting Lane uh, as a boy or as a young man. Um, and, and then one of the things that is intriguing is that after 1880, when it's presumed Homer didn't come back to Gloucester, he did come back. And he rented a house for three weeks. And uh, the, uh, the mysterious painting to which I alluded relates closely to uh, a real hero in Gloucester right up till today, Howard Blackburn. Um, and so that immersion in the particularity of a place also included some immersion in the social particularity, albeit one that Homer didn't particularly want us to know about. Does that help? So yeah. <laughs> I'm sensitive to the time um, and realize that some people are going to the 1030. Let me just um, mention that uh, on Tuesday at six o'clock, my friend Bruce Herman and I are gonna be in conversation at Gordon College in the Ken Olson Science Center. So that's six o'clock in the McDonald Auditorium. Uh, it'd be great if you can pre-register for that. And if you just go on to Google and do Gordon College, Winslow Homer, you'll get that. Um, and there will be books for sale then, and I would be delighted to sign them, or if you brought, brought me now, I'm happy to sign, but I'm afraid we don't have a bookseller here um, on Sunday morning. Um, and uh, Hannah Harlow at the Beverly Farms bookstore um, will be eager to do book signings going forward, um, and so that's another thing, yeah. Thank you.